I want to welcome everyone to A New Day is Dawning. And today we are going to be looking at the subject of In Search of the Church. In Search of the Church. Lucas Cranach was a fascinating Reformation figure. He was actually a contemporary of Martin Luther back in the 15th century. In fact, it was Lucas Cranach who painted the most famous portrait of Martin Luther. Another one of his most famous paintings was of the Fountain of Youth. You know, as far back as the 1500s, the Fountain of Youth was something people were very much interested in. When Juan Ponce de Leon arrived in Florida in 1513, he was looking for the Fountain of Youth. But, alas, the Fountain of Youth has never been found, and neither has the lost city of Atlantis. Nor has D.B. Cooper. In 1971, the fellow who became known as D.B. Cooper leapt out of a plane into a freezing rainstorm at 10,000 feet with $200,000 of ransom money and a parachute, and he was never seen again. Many believed um, that he died after he left, but others have even claimed to have been D.B. Cooper, even though their claims have been debunked over time. You know, no one knows what happened to this mysterious man. The lost city of Atlantis, the identity of D.B. Cooper, the killing of former President John F. Kennedy, these are all mysteries for most of us. You know, by the same token, finding God's church in these last days of Earth's history is, for many people, an absolute mystery. A lot of people don't know where to turn or how to find, you know, where to, where to find the true church. Which church should I attend? This is a question on the lips of many people. How can you know if there is a right church for you? Or maybe one church is just as good as another. Does God have a church? And before I answer that question, a lot of people today are saying, you know, God is okay, but for me, I don't feel like I need to be a part of a church. Or another one you might hear is, I don't mind God. I like Jesus. I just don't believe in organized religion. Can you imagine someone saying they don't believe in organized banking? Or they don't believe in an organized military? or they want disorganized education. But somehow when it comes to religion, a lot of people believe they don't want it to be organized. And I'm not sure what it would look like if it wasn't. Jesus was clear, he has a church. And he spoke to Peter one night and he said, you are Peter, Petros, a little stone. But speaking of himself, Jesus said, Upon this rock, I will build my church. You see, Jesus is the rock, Petra, of our salvation. Jesus is the rock, the stone cut out without hands. In Daniel chapter 2, we see that same vision, Jesus being the rock, coming from heaven to set up his kingdom. And Jesus said that he would build his church on himself. In the book of Revelation, he addresses seven churches. In the early Christian church, they were very much, very real, very organized churches. And they sent out missionaries. They had deacons and they, and they had elders. These were real organized churches. You see, Jesus in the book of Revelation, walking in the midst of the lampsticks, he describes his church throughout all of the centuries. In other words, he is walking in the midst of the churches. So very clearly, Jesus believed in church. His own church nailed him to a cross, yet still he supported his church and encouraged others to be faithful. Now, you're not going to find a perfect church. I hate to burst your bubble, but one just absolutely does not exist. Churches typically are made up of people, and people are never perfect. If you go back to the early days of Christianity, Paul confronted Peter about some of his issues. Paul and Barnabas had some struggles as they worked together. 
John Mark was sent home from a missionary trip. Things didn't always work out perfectly. So if you're looking for a perfect church, that will be impossible to find. But if you're wondering if God has a church for you down at the end of time, then you can look and search with real hope and expectation in your heart. You will find that the church that God has in the earth's last days will teach the Bible and will lift up Jesus Christ. Paul described that church in his letter to Timothy. He said in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, that the church will be the pillar and ground of the truth. We're introduced to God's church in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, where the word of God says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. In Revelation chapter 12, you find a picture of God's church down through the ages. And in verse 6, it says, Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Those were the 1,260 days or years during which the first nation mentioned in Revelation chapter 13 kept the truth, God's word, in the dark. The Bible was kept from people. People couldn't read it, so it was in a period of darkness. And the church was, in a sense, in the wilderness. True Christians, Bible-believing Christians, were persecuted frequently. The Waldenses and the Albigenses, the Huguenots, and others were persecuted in those days. Terrible corruptions, horrible false teachings infiltrated the Christian church during this period of time. Not only were millions of people put to death and persecuted because of their faith in the Bible, but the church became darkened with teachings that had no basis in the Bible. Then, Bible truths were crowded out of the church by traditions and were pushed out of the church by apostasy. There were a number of false teachings that came into Christianity during these days. For instance, infant baptism replaced baptism by immersion. Transubstantiation replaced the truth of the Lord's Supper. Transubstantiation. Sorry, transubstantiation teaches that the bread and the juice are the literal body and the literal blood of Jesus. And they're actually symbols. And the symbolism was lost sight of as this false teaching came into the church. The natural immortality of the soul replaced the truth of the sleep in death. Confession to a priest took the place of confession to God through Jesus Christ. And of course, as we discussed, the pagan day of the sun, or Sunday, supplanted the Bible Sabbath and took its place in Christendom. It was not God's plan, but that's what happened. The church was in the wilderness. Apostasy came in, and people were confused by the traditions set up by the early history of the church. But God did not, he did have a faithful people down through all that time. God was not going to allow the church to stay in the wilderness forever. He needed to have a church that would shine his light in a dark world. He needed to have a church that would uphold his word and show people the true path that God wants us to follow and demonstrate how people could know God and know his truth. He would have a body dedicated to the ideal of preparing people for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And what would that church look like? Well, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman. Well, who does the dragon represent? Of course, you know, that's Satan. So the devil was angry with the woman. Well, a woman in Bible prophecy represents God's church. So the devil, Satan, was mad with God's church, and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Now, the Bible describes the remnant as being those which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
And you will notice that in the last days of Earth's history, the church is back. The Bible speaks about the rest of her offspring or the remnant of her seed. The remnant, that which remains, is that certain part of the church left over down at the end of time. So the church comes back from the wilderness. The remnant describes that part which remains at the very end. It's not the whole. It's smaller than that. Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. Truth is always going to be in the minority. Remember, Revelation says down in the end of time that all the world wondered after or followed after the beast. Even in the time of compromise, there will be a remnant back from the wilderness, drawn together by the Holy Spirit, kept by the grace of God to take the truth of God's word all the way down to the finish line of time and get people ready to meet Jesus Christ. God's people then will be crowned with crowns of victory. And we notice something interesting. The Bible says that God will have a people who remain down in the close of time. That's right. There is a true church of God even in this day and age all the way until the second coming of Jesus. When the world follows the beast, there will be people clinging to the Bible. When the world goes after tradition, there will be those, the remnant, who stands on the scripture. It won't be a perfect group of people, mind you, because perfect people don't exist. The only perfect one, as you know, is Jesus Christ. However, we should be able to find a belief system that is founded in the word of God and isn't resting on tradition. If God is going to have a people in the end who will be faithful to his word, then surely we must want to be in that group, right? If God has a pathway of accuracy to the scriptures, a pathway of truth, a faithful, loving obedience, that's where we want to be, right? But the question is, how do you find it? Well, the best thing to do is obviously go to the Bible. Let the scripture be your guide. The word of God gives us identification marks so that we can know God's church in the end of time when we see it. So today we are going to take a look at some of these identifying marks that the Bible describes his last day church. Now, the first one is in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And there it reads, And the dragon, or the devil, was wroth with the woman, which we know now as the church. And the devil went to make war with the remnant of her seed. And take notice, these are people who will keep the commandments of God. Now, that little phrase, those Five little words, keep the commandments of God, is of utmost importance. The number one identifying mark for God's church, for God's people in the last days, is that they will be commandment keepers. They keep the commandments of God, which should probably go without saying, right? Does God want us to obey him? Of course he does. Does he want us to keep the Ten Commandments? Of course he does. Does that mean we want to be saved by our works? No, it doesn't. Okay, so we're not doing it because of works. We're doing it because we love God and God knew what was best for us. When you love somebody, you want to please them. If you love your spouse, you please your spouse. If you love your parents or if you love your children, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to love and you're going to live to please them, right? Well, when Jesus died for us, the response that takes place in our lives should come naturally. When we see Jesus on the cross and we witness the nails in his hands and the crown of thorns on his head and Jesus suffering, hanging on an old rugged cross, we are instantly drawn to him. And we say, Jesus, not my will, but your will be done. You see, that's the natural response. Our hearts are filled with with love for God, and we do it because we want to do his will, because of what he has done for us. So we say with, for example, um, David, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yes, thy law is within my heart. 
And so God has a people in the close of time who will keep the commandments. Let's look now at Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, where it says that God's last day message is the everlasting gospel. That indicates that his church, if it has a message at all, will have a gospel message to take to the world. That salvation is free. It's found in Jesus Christ and it's available to all. Christ died for our sins. We are saved by grace through faith and salvation comes as a gift from Jesus. God's church must proclaim that because it's proclaiming the everlasting gospel, the everlasting good news. Now the question is, where in the world will God's church proclaim this everlasting gospel? Well, Revelation 14, 6 is very clear by telling us that the gospel is taken to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Not to just one or two, but to every nation. Not to just one single country, but to all tribes, all tongues, even those in the remotest areas found around the globe. Well, that would mean that if you find a church that exists on one street, one city block, or in one town, one county, one nation, one continent, it cannot possibly be the remnant church. Why is that? Because the remnant church, which keeps the commandments and preaches this everlasting gospel, will reach the entire world. It will be a worldwide movement. The gospel will go to every nation, to every kindred, to every tongue, and to every people. In other words, it will go to the world. Now, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, brings us to another very important point about the remnant. It says, towards the bottom of that verse, that they keep the commandments of God, and notice what it says here, they have the testimony of who? Of Jesus Christ. Now, many people try to figure out, what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Well, it's very important that when you ask the question, what is the testimony of Jesus Christ that you allow the Bible to interpret itself? Allow the Bible or allow God to tell us what that testimony of Jesus Christ is. Because many people say, oh, I proclaim Jesus, I was saved, therefore I am part of that remnant. I am testi testifying to Jesus, right? Well, what does the Bible actually say is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Well, Revelation 19 verse 10 is very clear that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Or, in other words, this movement, this worldwide movement with this everlasting gospel will have in it the gift of prophecy. Not only prophesying, but understanding the prophecies of and consistent with the Old and the New Testament, which would include Daniel. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, many of the minor prophets that lead into the Gospels and the testimony of prophecy given by Jesus himself, particularly found in Matthew 24, all the way to the book of Revelation. Now, when we look at this list, we see that the last day church keeps the commandments, preaches the everlasting gospel, it reaches the entire world, and additionally has the testimony of Jesus, which is the gift of prophecy or the spirit of prophecy. But what is this gift of prophecy? You know, did Nostradamus have it? Did Gene Dixon have it? No, the tabloids and the little prog uh, prognosticators are not the Holy Spirit at work. That's not the gift of prophecy. So what is the testimony of Jesus? How do we identify this gift of prophecy. You can't just be a prophet because you call yourself one. A man once said, we had a great night at our church last night because brother so-and-so was there and he's a prophet. A friend then asked him, how do you know that he's a prophet? And he said, you know, I don't know. I never really thought about that, but the preacher said he was a prophet, so he had to have been a prophet. Okay, and you'll find some churches where every second person is a prophet. Everyone has a word from the Lord, a message from the Lord, a prophecy from the Lord. Well, how do we know what's actually genuine? It's important that we know how to separate the true from the false. 
because Jesus warned us against false prophets. Now, those of you who are watching me for the first time, I actually have a, a lecture, a sermon that I gave, The Seven Tests of a Prophet. Make sure you check that out on the Future of Hope YouTube channel. When Jesus said, beware of false prophets, he was helping us understand that the gift of prophecy is legitimate. It is legitimate. Therefore, you have to be aware that there will be false prophets. He didn't say beware of anyone at all who claims to have the gift of prophecy. He didn't say that, right? Okay, it would in Christ's mind be a bona fide gift of the Spirit. So the gift of prophecy is actually very real. Take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. Here it says, and God hath appointed these in the church. Look at First, he gave apostles. Second, what does it say there? Prophets. Third, teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healing helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Just as he gives other spiritual gifts, he gives a gift of prophecy. And it's up to us to identify the genuine and not be sucked in by the spurious or the counterfeit. So how could we know whether or not something was the genuine gift of prophecy? Okay, in a nutshell, here are some points from the Bible. First point. Jeremiah chapter 28 verse 9 made very clear that the gift of prophecy would be accurate. Okay, is it accurate? Now, not all prophecy is predictive, but if Daniel had said there would be four metals and then the feet and toes, but there were actually six great world ruling nations before the feet and toes, we'd say that Daniel was what? He was wrong, right? So the prophecy has to be accurate. If he had said seven beasts and then the beast with ten horns, but in fact there were four nations in Daniel 7, we would say that Daniel was what? Wrong again. But he made a prediction looking far off into the future, and we know that Daniel was absolutely accurate. He said the exact number, the way it would occur, and that is exactly how it occurred, because God gave it. Being accurate is one point in identifying the genuine gift of prophecy. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1 through 3, makes it also very clear that someone with the gift of prophecy must also be in harmony with the Bible. In other words, it will not be contradictory to the Old Testament or to the New Testament. It would be consistent and uh, would be in harmony with the rest of the scriptures. In other words, if the word of God says one thing, but someone who proclaims to have the gift of prophecy says something else, okay, well, that's contradictory. That would not be the gift of prophecy. That would be a counterfeit or even apostasy, and that would be error. So the gift of prophecy supports and is in harmony with the Bible. Now, the genuine gift of prophecy will exalt Jesus, and that is absolutely certain. It has to have at some point exalt Jesus and his saving power. The genuine gift of prophecy will also uphold God's law. How do we know that? Because um, it actually says it in the Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. It says, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. It's fashionable today for people to say, we don't have to keep the commandments of God. I think that most people who say that mean that commandment keeping doesn't save us. I would agree with that. I think they want to impress upon us that we are not saved by our works or our deeds. But if what somebody is saying is, you can live in disobedience to the Ten Commandments and it doesn't matter a bit to God. Well, that's wrong. Jesus said, if you love me, then keep my commandments. And when you read in Revelation chapter 22, these words, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have a right to the tree of life. Well, that makes it clear that commandment keeping is very important to God. The Bible says in 1 John that his commandments are not grievous. So clearly the Lord wants us to obey him. And really, obedience to God is an inevitability. 
when you have a heart that is filled with love for God, then obeying him will come very natural. So somebody who claims to be speaking on behalf of God would certainly not be speaking against his law. Point number five um, is that the gift of prophecy would be found in the church. It's not the gift of prophecy when it's on the late night talk show and in the tabloids, right? The genuine gift of prophecy is a spiritual gift given by God for the blessing of the church. We need to keep in mind why God even gives the gift of prophecy. What is the purpose of prophecy? Well, we go back in time to the time of the flood. Before the flood, God raised up Noah and gave him the gift of prophecy. Why? Because he wanted his people to be ready for the flood, to be saved, ready for the danger that was going to come. Well, fast forward a little bit to John the Baptist. God wanted people to be ready to meet the Messiah when the Messiah came that very first time. Now, it would make sense then that God would give the gift of prophecy in the end of time to get people ready for the second coming of Jesus, right? You would expect that if you look at the biblical pattern and how God has worked down through time, God would call people to be faithful to the word of God, to love God with their whole heart, to encourage people to surrender fully. That's what the gift of prophecy would be for. You know, Amos said in Amos chapter 3, verse 7, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals it, his secret, to his servants, the prophets. And God said his remnant in the last days would have that gift of prophecy working in its midst. So how did God place the gift of prophecy in the remnant? Keeping commandments of God. Well, I want to take you back in time to the 1800s. There was a, a man of God. He was a Baptist minister named William Miller. William Miller studied the prophecies of the Bible and he came to the conclusion that Jesus was returning in 1843. So from the Baptist church, we get this minister who was a very diligent student of Daniel. And he came up with the conclusion that Jesus was going to return in 1843. Well, Jesus didn't come back in 1843. So they reconfigured and said, you know, he's coming a year later. Still, Jesus did not come back. But what happened was, even though he was a godly man, Miller was simply wrong in his calculations. But Miller got people thinking about the second coming of Jesus. And this was the first time in a long time that the church had been really focused on this idea that Christ was coming back. God wanted to guide this people. He said, these will be a people who take my truth all the way down to the finish line. And he placed his hand on the heart of a young 17-year-old young woman from the Methodist Church. And he gave to her a very special gift. He gave to this young Methodist teenager the gift of prophecy. And through this young lady... God shared great wisdom with the church and with the world for more than 70 years. Today, there are more than 100 books that were written or have been compiled from the writings of this young lady. There has been no other female author in the history of literature translated into more languages than this woman who had a very minimal education, but was endowed by a great blessing and measure of the Holy Spirit of the Almighty God. And what she shared with others about Christ and his word has changed lives around the world. And the church that she helped to found, the movement that she helped to found, to establish, is in more countries on the planet Earth than any other Protestant movement in the world today. This movement, this church, is in 220 countries of the recognized 230 countries around the globe as of 2020. Her book, Steps to Christ, is the best book that I know outside of the Bible to help people establish a relationship with God 
and maintain a relationship with God. You may have your personal favorite, but this book is absolutely amazing if you haven't read it. The book is called Steps to Christ. She wrote about the life of Christ, about the parables of Jesus, and wrote a lot of encouraging people um, as to how they can grow in the grace of God. She wrote a book called Ministry of Healing. Some have said the Ministry of Healing was 100 years ahead of its time. It dealt with the connection between physical and spiritual health long before people as a whole were talking about it. Ellen White was writing about the mind-body connection and encouraging people to look after their body temple that it would advance them in a spiritual way. At a time when doctors were prescribing tobacco, she said tobacco is a slow, insidious, but most malignant poison. She said this decades and decades ahead of the Surgeon General. One nutritionist from Corn Cornell University, a Dr. Clive McKay, said, whatever may be the religious belief of a reader, he or she cannot help but gain much guidance in a better and healthier way of life from reading the major works of Ellen White. Every modern specialist in nutrition whose life is dedicated to human welfare must be impressed, impressed by the writings and leadership of this young female 17 year old teenager given this gift of prophecy. Her ministry helped thousands of people around the planet establish a relationship with Jesus that has grown their faith in Christ and in the word of God. That's what the gift of prophecy is actually supposed to do, right? Well, the gift of prophecy is not like having another Bible. It's not a replacement for the Bible. No one would say, oh, it's like another book of the Bible, right? The Bible is to be the sole rule of our faith and practice, period. But the gift of prophecy was blessed by God to point us toward the Bible and to point us to Jesus and to point us to our hope in earth's last days. And I want to encourage you, if you don't know anything about what this lady has written, become familiar with what she's written. Tonight, I will give you one of the books that she wrote, um, a, a title called, um, and as you read it, you're going to be blessed by it. It's called Steps to Christ. And if you haven't read Steps to Christ, another book is The Desire of Ages. Both of those books will give you a deeper insight into who Jesus was. Now let's look again at our identifying marks of God's last day remnant. It keeps the commandments of God, preaches the everlasting gospel, reaches the entire world, and has the gift of prophecy. Revelation 18.1 says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. These are powerful words written by John the Revelator. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed for fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. A dramatic indictment against falsehood on planet earth in earth's last days. And then God says this in verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. Come out of Babylon. Grow in the light of God's word. God is calling people out of Babylon, out of that confusion, out of that apostasy, and into his remnant, into those who are keeping the commandments of God and have the faith and testimony of Jesus. So there we see five very clear points from the Bible, and we might have been able to find others as well had we the time. Now, as we look at these identifying um, points, if you take those and compare them to whatever you might find in the Christian landscape, you will discover there is only one community of faith that, that can fulfill 
all of these biblical points. Are they perfect? No, they're not perfect, but they were started by a movement with these gifts and they fulfill all of these identifying marks that we have discovered in the book of uh, Revelation. Now you might ask, does that mean that what you're saying is that only people who go to this church are Christians and only people in this church can be saved? Of course not. That's exactly not what I'm saying, okay? You know better. I know better than that. And I wouldn't even think of that. But what I can tell you is this. God wants to guide us in spirit and he wants to guide us in truth. And he wants us to be in a safe place. Following the Bible, right? Not caught up in traditions, but we are on the edge of this most exciting, profound um, time when Jesus could be coming very soon, which means that we are on the edge of the most exciting and profound movements in all of Earth's history. Jesus is coming back soon, and Christ is calling you. He's calling you, and the question is, is are you glad to follow in the pathway of his word? Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18 tells us, but the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto that perfect day. Back in 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. He walked up to what is called today Schlosskirch, and he left them on the castle door. He didn't want to leave his church. He loved his church. He had every hope that his church would reform and would embrace the Bible and its truths. However, it did not. Luther was separated from the church and his followers followed him and they became what we know today as Lutherans. That's where they stopped. They didn't press on. The same thing happened to Calvin. Calvin added more light, but his followers advanced only as far as Calvin. And you might say the same thing was true of Zwingli. Zwingli added even more light and then his followers stopped where Zwingli stopped. And the same was true for John Knox and John Wesley. Luther added the truth about justification by faith. The Anabaptist through baptism by immersion. And then John Wesley taught about the new birth. And then William Miller, a Baptist preacher, alerted the world to the fact that Jesus was coming back again, the second coming, and it became a very hot topic among Christians around the world. And then came the call that in light of the returning Christ, one who loves God would want to keep the commandments of God, all 10 of them, including the one that talks about the seventh day Sabbath. Out of this, there came a movement that became known as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that it's perfect or that its people are perfect because, in fact, it is not perfect. However, it stands on the Bible and it stands on the Bible alone. And as we compare the Bible to the teachings of churches across the Christian landscape, we can see that God has a church teaching as close as can be found to the word of God. It stands on the foundation of the word of God. And it stands on the foundation laid of other great men and women of God who came before a church that I believe God is inviting you to become a part of so that you are a part of what God calls his remnant who would keep his commandments who would have the faith of Jesus. When the pilgrims were about to leave the Netherlands to come to the new world, their pastor stayed behind. Pastor John Robinson said to them as they knelt together on the sand beside the ocean, I charge you before God that you follow me no further than you have seen me follow Christ. For I am verily persuaded the Lord hath more truth and light yet to break forth from his holy word. Did you notice that? I believe God has still more light 
you have followed me. That's okay. But follow me as I follow the word. Now keep pressing on. Keep pushing on. You've got to continue to learn. You've got to grow. Take hold of the truth now because I have more for you is what God is saying. I want to put my zeal um, inside of you. I want to seal you on your foreheads. I want to write my law on your heart. I want to write your name in the book of life. I want to see your footprints on the sea of glass and on the streets of gold. And God calls you and I to follow and grow in his advancing light. This is why Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 16, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus wants to gather his sheep together. The scarlet woman wants to lead us astray with error and untruth. This is that um, revelation um, prophecy that we read where she wants us to follow traditions and unscriptural teachings based in the traditions of the church. God has been leading people back to the Bible, to the unadulterated truth, to the ancient truths that God gave us. He shines his light in our hearts and he says to us, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Friend, I want to submit to you tonight that it is no accident you have been here. Because God is love and in his love, he is drawing you. He isn't calling you and asking you just to stay put. He's asking you to stand up and step forward and follow the advancing light of truth. I want to give you this opportunity tonight to tell Jesus that you are ready to follow him because of what he has done for you. He died for you. He rose for you and ascended for you. And guess what? He's coming back for you. I want to give you that opportunity at this moment to tell Jesus that you are ready to follow him because of what he has done. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you and submit ourselves to you. We recognize, Lord, that there is advancing light and that we want to follow this truth that you have presented before us night in, night out, as we've studied the books of Daniel and Revelation, as we've considered the themes of righteousness by faith and all the work that your son Jesus has done. In his name, we claim the promise, his sacrifice, that one day he will come back for us and we pray that we will be among those whose names are written in the book of life. Lord, you have given us an opportunity tonight to tell you and to tell your son that we are ready to follow because of what you have done. Father, we thank you that you died, that Jesus died for us, that he rose, that he ascended and I thank you that you will someday, very soon, give the command to return back and redeem the righteous. We pray that we will be among those who can be called the righteous. So in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Amen. All right, everyone. I want to thank everyone for joining me. Um, we are currently on break in the book of Daniel. We will be coming back in several weeks, so keep following watching for new updates on new series that will be coming up in the next several weeks. But until then, keep looking up because guess what? A new day is dawning. Bye, everyone.